Welcome back to New Rockstars. It's Eric Voss and Philip Molina here with The Big Question. It's our weekly Q&A show where we're gonna dive deep into the questions that really only nerds care that much about, but if you wanna avoid pissing off the Hulk, uh, you're gonna wanna get the answers to this one. Why is the Hulk ready to be so mad? Well, it's the Hulk. It's, it's, like it's in his thing. His, it's in his name. It's his whole thing. So this episode, I'm going to answer one big question that Philip has assigned me. Philip's gonna answer three bite-sized bite questions. Bite-sized questions. Yes. Ah. And then once the uh, booze starts to kick in, we'll uh, answer some fan mail questions. Because this started with like Philip and I just like getting drunk, getting Hulk smashed. We just started rolling cameras, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> here we, are. we built this set just drunkenly tearing apart the room we were in. Well, let's get started. Started. Okay. <laughs> this question came from somebody on social media. His name's Sean Spaulding. Okay. Uh, and he wants to know, and I thought this was a great question actually, <laughs> what happens if the Hulk claps as hard as he can? As hard as he can. And like like specifically like considering that he can do it kind of casually. <laughs> yeah, he could. And he could do it like quickly he in the moment of battle. Flat. Yeah, exactly. He can do yeah. it politely. But Full Hulk strength. I love this question because I think we're talking about Hulk's thunderclap, right? The thunderclap is a move that he uses all the time in the comics. Basically, he just like collapses his hands together and it creates like this sonic boom or this strong wind and it makes an amazing <laughs> sound effect in the comics. I saw Thoom, I've seen Cuthroom, I've seen Woomph. There it is. There it is, yeah. There's the clap, and he, he like smiles when he does it. He knocks people off their feet. It's been described as like a um, sonic boom, as a hurricane force. In some cases, it's been deadly. It's been known to kill people. That's how powerful it is. But I'm curious to know, have we seen this in the MCU? And the thing is, in the Marvel films, it's not a very common thing. I think because it's like Joss Whedon considered it just like a goofy move, so we never saw it in the first Avengers or Age of Ultron, and Taika Waititi didn't do it in Thor Ragnarok, and and in, in Infinity War and Endgame, Hulk hasn't gotten a ton of big action scenes, at least where he's at a distance, to be able to use this move. Yeah, well also it gets confusing, is it wind or is it percussive force? Right? I'll get to it, I, I looked into this way okay. too hard. Um, you have so many notes. You know, so many notes. <laughs> uh, we did see it one time. I, I don't think we ever saw Ruffalo Hulk do it, but we did see Ed Norton Hulk do it mm. in the first Incredible Hulk movie. A fire engulfs a helicopter, a crash helicopter that Betty oh. Ross and Thunderbolt Ross are in, and he gets away from Abomination and he goes, Rah! Yeah. And the wind or the, the sonic boom puts out the fire. Liquefies the organs of everyone inside. <laughs> <laughs> it should have, because here's the deal. Normally, wind, even a strong wind, fans flames. Whenever there's strong wind <laughs> yeah. in LA, it causes fires to spread. Right. It does not put out fires. And if the jet fuel is still hot enough, as it would have been in that moment, it would just reignite. It wouldn't just like uh, freeze the fire. Only out. if it sucked the oxygen out of yes. the, the room, like when you wear a beautiful dress. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. Yeah. No one ever <gasps> says anything. I was gonna stop wearing them. <laughs> what he must have done is create a kind of shock wave. And what a shock wave does is it's not just like wind, it, it displaces the air molecules. And they've actually experimented with doing this to try to put out forest fires. University <laughs> of New South Wales has created like this tube that blasts a a pressurized air to displace a flame off of its fuel source, thereby extinguishing it. It basically moves the fire like a meter away from I've the flame. I've seen the fish tube, I know how it works. <laughs> In 2018, the Swedish Air Force, didn't know they had one, uh, dropped a 500 pound bomb in the air above a forest fire uh, using <laughs> that blast. Wait, it worked? They bombed a forest fire to put out the fire, which sounds counterintuitive, but it actually speaks to how bombs really work. It's not a fireball when it explodes, unless it hits like a fuel source or a black powder charge. Really, all bombs are like pressurized air that puts a blast out. So like if it's an IED, it kicks up the dirt, but it doesn't create a uh, flame unless it hits like a fuel source. Now, nuclear bombs are different because they literally light the air on fire in that case. They cause the air molecules to spread out so quickly, that speed causes an intense thermonuclear blast that causes the air and everything in the area to turn to ash. Did the forest fire go out when they did that? It did, it worked. Whoa. But it's too, it's too risky because you're essentially dropping a bomb. You don't know if you're going to kill wildlife in the area or people who may be trying to put it out. It's a very risky like, thing. Like, they didn't tell the firefighters? <laughs> <laughs> 
When will they ever learn? But it's still considered an experimental thing, but a lot of people are, are proposing using these kind of blasts to put out wildfires instead of trying to drop water over them, which doesn't always, you need to kind of like still the air essentially in order to, to use this. So if we apply that to Hulk's thunderclap putting out the fire, what he must have done was create a sonic boom. So what's this uh, sonic, sonic boom? boom? Sonic boom. It's when a moving object is moving so fast, the object suddenly breaks the sound barrier, and it's moving faster than the speed mm -hmm. of sound. And it causes the air molecules to be pushed aside so quickly with such great force, it forms a really strong shockwave. On a miniature scale, we see this with a crack of a whip, right? Like, we see the whip crack, and because it happens so fast, as a whiplash sound, it pressurizes the air so quickly, it makes this, like, snap, a pop. We've seen this with, like, uh, jet engines mm -hmm. that fly too close to the ground. It's been known to shatter glass. If it if it flies too close to the ground, it's like a big boom. People describe it as like an earthquake feeling. It can rattle buildings. In order to create such a shock wave, the decibel level of such a uh, sonic boom would need to be 195 decibels. Now that is loud enough to rupture eardrums at a close range, roughly the distance Hulk was from Eddie Ross. Now the thing about decibels is they increase logarithmically. So like the difference between 195 decibels and 200 decibels is like huge enough for them just rupturing your eardrums to causing instant death. Oh, so, wow. okay. um, so the way that works is it ruptures your, your lung tissue and you choke on blood. It's a horrible, horrible death. Fun. <laughs> yeah. So getting this back to this moment, in the comics, Hulk's claps, as I said, have been called a sonic boom. Now these are comic book writers who don't know what that means. A sonic boom is 212 decibels. Thunder, fun fact, is at 215 decibels. Maybe that's why it's called the thunderclap, because it's like being in a cloud of thunder and lightning mm. as it erupts. If the sound alone would kill you, mm -hmm. <laughs> just because it's so powerful of a sound. And it's like air pressure that's like rupturing your body tissue and your blood, and it just causes you to die. The comics uh, have also described Hulk's thunderclap as being the force of hurricane winds. Hurricanes are super powerful. If you were to condense them all into a focused, condensed blast, mm -hmm. that would be the loudest sound ever recorded, 300 decibels, which could melt concrete. <laughs> Melt. <laughs> That's how powerful if you were to condense it all into one focused blast. Because you think hurricanes are spread out. They're like miles and miles wide. Right. That's like roughly at least double the acoustic power of a nuclear bomb going off. So nuclear bombs turn you to ash. They melt concrete. That's how strong a hurricane force <laughs> blast would be if Hulk clapped his hands. If Hulk could thunderclap this sonic boom to put out the fire on the, on the helicopter, at that range, he also would have made Betty Ross's and Thunderbolt Ross's ears bleed maybe cause him to choke on blood. Yeah, yeah. Which is not saving them at all. That's how powerful it is when he's too excited. But he put the fire out. But he put the fire <laughs> out, right? In that moment, we should also have to assume that Hulk is berserk enough. He doesn't have control. He's not doing a golf clap. He's not yet reached the point of stasis and balance that uh, Professor Hulk is. He's not wearing game. glasses. He's not wearing glasses. He's not wearing clothes, except uh, elastic uh, pants that never rip. And uh, so, <laughs> why are you so jealous? <laughs> <laughs> because my pants rip constantly. We'll find out about that later in the show. Maybe he has no control over ex exertion. His, he's clapping as hard as he can. Also, something that I want to dig into. We know that Hulk's strength increases infinitely, right? As yes. the angrier he gets, the stronger right. he gets, without limit. He just gets more and more powerful. So the more he's hit, the more angrier and powerful he gets. So if you think when you clap your hands, if you watch super slow motion of hands clapping. It's a little dance between each of the meat of your hands. Each hand, it's like a sine wave almost. It goes up mm -hmm. and down and your, your meat pushes back into each other until it reaches. <laughs> Tell me more about my meat. Hand. I'm gonna shove this in me like the <laughs> is. So imagine a little conflict going on between Hulk's big hands when he claps. Theoretically, <laughs> that think, could make his hands, each of his hands angrier and angrier, matter and angrier at matter at each other, creating a focused, a miniature heightened spike of power so that this thunderclap could have at least ruptured their eardrums, but also could be powerful enough to create a hurricane force level blast that could level a city like a nuclear blast is. Uh, Betty Ross should have been like Sarah Connor in that scene in T2 Judgment Just Day like holding where her <laughs> skin gets blown off her bones. That's what should have happened in that moment. Because in the comics, Hulk has been known to get as powerful to level cities, to almost destroy the entire United States with a stomp. Uh, he's been as powerful as being called the World Breaker Hulk, mm -hmm. where he can turn planets to dust. So yes, if uh, Hulk ragefully thunderclaps his hands as hard as he can to answer your question, he could at least kill someone instantly, at worst, level an entire city. 
It sounds like even more theoretically if you if his hand meets <laughs> continue to piss each other off. Yes. I like that I'm also still picturing Edward Norton in Fight Club where he's beating himself up. Yeah. Hulk could do that to get stronger. Yeah, if he wanted to get powered up in a moment to like knock a building down, he should just keep hitting himself in the face. Man, that'd be awesome. Should well, be have big. I proven to you why they need to show the thunderclap in the MCU? Because I think Joss Whedon just thought it looked goofy because it is kind of a comics thing to be like, aha, wind. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the wind version, I think, is what's probably a little confusing because we're imagining surface area, like here. sails, right. are creating an, enough of a gust. I did try to measure the the size of Hulk's hands on average, but he, he does get bigger and bigger based on how angrier he gets. But in that moment where a Black Lucky Widow Betsy brushes Ross. her hand across his palm, uh, roughly, I would say his hands are roughly around three feet wide when put together, like if you clap, you know, you're forming the wingspan of like a gold eagle or a California condor in that moment. And when they flap their wings, they don't knock people off their feet. Right. Even unless they were to do it real fast. And I think we have to imagine that Hulk's strength allows him to build up momentum as he's clapping. Well, he doesn't have bird bones. We feel like we have bird bones after he claps at us. I, I didn't expect there to be so much talk about like liquefying people, but that's great. So if you're a Broadway performer and Hulk's in the audience, just be very careful how much <laughs> you commit to the final number. Time for a break. <laughs> uh, hey guys, Eric here. Just a reminder that New Rockstars is offering exclusive rewards to our patrons in the form of bonus videos each month. For November, I did an in-depth breakdown of the opening sequence of Raiders of the Lost Ark and how it so perfectly defined Indiana Jones as a hero and foreshadowed everything to follow in that film, including Nazis' heads exploding. You can get exclusive access to that video along with lots of other behind-the-scenes content and just a general good feeling of helping this channel grow by becoming an official patron of New Rockstars Digital Studios. Just go to patreon.com slash new rockstars. Again, that's patreon.com slash new rockstars. And we are back now, <laughs> moving on to some more bite-sized questions that you guys sent in to us. Philip is going to take these, and these are just as important as Hulk's clapping <laughs> power. No less important. Are you okay. trying to make me feel better <laughs> about this? At Major Danger 11 asked, why did Janet Van Dyne age mm. in the quantum realm when Scott Lang stayed roughly the same age? Okay, so, so a lot of people brought this up as a plot hole, uh -huh. actually. They were like, how come Janet says specifically, I'm not the same woman I was 30 years ago, and she looks 30 years old, still mm. tight. Oh, yeah. But 30 years older, uh -huh. uh, she got the silver streaks, and then when Scott Lang goes in, he has skipped five years, yeah. and it's been a matter of minutes for Still him. very much clueless, Paul Rudd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like he doesn't age. What's most likely the answer in the canon is just based on the concept of the time vortex. Right. She specifically says, look out for time vortices, essentially. Right at the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And don't get sucked into a time vortex. We won't be able to save you. We do know that's setting up Endgame. The creators of the film have confirmed that that is the difference of the experience that Scott Lang does. He goes in there and he does go through a time vortex, even though they didn't show it to us. They're like, yeah, everybody got that, right? I don't know that everybody did get that, but he went through a time vortex, she did not. Uh -huh. He skipped ahead five years, she did not. She stayed there 30 years. But I actually think that there's a slightly more interesting element to this question, where if you think about the fact that Janet Van Dyne in the quantum realm clearly lived a life in there, right? Yeah. Her clothes are developed in a way where she clearly has had access to a sewing machine or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but she also <laughs> was involved in the civilization, it kind of sounds like. We multiple times pointed out that city in the quantum realm. Yeah. Was, under my understanding, I could imagine this city is created in a space in the quantum realm where time is kind of secure within this bubble. Oh. It's a safe place to house her for people to live and, and live normally outside of this bubble. Now you're in the torrential storm of the quantum realm sure. where, you know, the different sizes you are create that relativity in time that Einstein theorized. Mm. Any other area of the quantum realm also might put you through time at a different speed than a nice, secure, safe space. Uh, place like, like that, that city. That's interesting. Yeah. So outside of the city, there are these like holes, basically, right. that these ditches that you can fall into that suck you through time. Right. And aside from those holes, even just in general, the quantum realm is unstable in terms of yeah. a linear timeline. Okay. I, I like that answer. At Reef underscore 98 said, how does Arthur Fleck fire eight shots from his gun without reloading? And this is in Joker. Yeah, I remember this scene. Yeah. Mistake. <laughs> it's a mistake. Answer. No, it's not my full answer, actually. So I did look into it anyway. I mean, probably a mistake, right? Because we see this in films all the yeah, time. Yeah, like Walking People... Dead, Rick is just from that pipe. Endless. Endless. Yeah. yeah, endless bullets. 
there is one interesting thing about this film. Maybe it's not a mistake. So the gun he uses is a Colt Detective Special, the third generation of that gun. Absolutely is a six shot gun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because there are some revolvers that, that fire can't eight. hold, yeah, can't but hold not eight. this one. People theorize maybe he was using an eight uh, shot one. No, it specifically should only be six. That could be the mistake, or it could be just one more clue that this sequence might be imagined. We do know that this is some very large spectacle event that the news is covering to an extent where everyone wants to know who's killed these guys. It's the whole Thomas Wayne, uh, the the fact that he actually comes off as a villain is because he's sympathizing with kind of the wrong side of the class warfare that's right, happening right, right. in this moment. And we do know that Joker's egomania is, is putting him at the center of things, right? Mm -hmm. he, he imagines he goes on Murray's show and he's gonna be brought down from the audience and he's gonna be the star of the thing. The idea that he would be watching something like this on the news and imagine that, well, what if it was me that killed these guys, which, is one of the scenes that is not confirmed actually 100% that he was the one that, that killed them, then that would make sense that he actually doesn't understand guns well enough to know how many shots they would have. He specifically, when he's given the gun earlier, he says that he's supposed to stay away from those things. Yeah. He clearly has been found to have uh, mental issues. It wouldn't be surprising if there is some sort of better background check situation in mm -hmm. uh, Gotham than in the real world, where if you are established to be someone of a certain uh, mental state, you're not allowed to yeah, have Yeah, they have red guns. flag laws. There, exactly. Yeah. Then he would not have experience with these guns. So his guess is, I don't know, maybe he has eight shots, maybe he has endless sure, shots. Sure, sure. It's like Fight Club, like he's applying his own understanding of how right. violence works to his own life, his imagined life. And then you can still even use this argument, even if he was the guy that killed those guys, then maybe just two, the last two shots weren't real. Yeah, it was uh, like he walked up to it and plugged it point yeah. blank range a couple more times. Right, yeah. so just those extra like cool shots or something, maybe those weren't real, but probably just a mistake. Probably just a mistake, yeah. We have a question from Caleb Tegeler. In the Infinity War opening scene, why does Heimdall use the Bifrost to save Hulk instead of Thor? Okay, so this question actually was my favorite one of this batch. There's kind of a straightforward answer and then there's a interesting comics uh, lore answer. The most straightforward version of this is that in this moment, the Asgardians, what's left of them, are there. Heimdall is there, Hulk is there, and Thanos and his peeps are there. In this moment, Heimdall decides, I'm gonna send Hulk to Earth as a, as a warning, basically. Now, the most simple logic you can understand here is why would he send Thor if Thor is the leader and guardian of the Asgardians, and here's the potentially the final moment of the mm -hmm. Asgardians. You don't take away the warrior who's there to defend the Asgardians mm -hmm. and send him to Earth, and now they're like, great, Hulk is here who doesn't give a shit about us. Mm -hmm. If you just think of it as simply as that, Thor is an Asgardian, he protects Asgardians. He goes down with the ship. Basically, yeah. and then Hulk is an Earthling, send him oh, to Earth, right, gotcha. of, of okay. all those people. So that's the easiest logic yeah. to understand. Except, this is what I was thinking was really interesting about it. You also have to remember in that moment, they're not on Asgard. They're not using the traditional Bifrost Bridge situation, this room that is established that they've used multiple times in the MCU. Mm -hmm. In the comics, the Bifrost Bridge is a big deal to channel that, yeah. and it uses that dark magic. The dark magic actually is a destructive force that is very hard to wield. In the comics, when you send someone through it, you actually might kill them. It's, it's oh. even Thor, it's very scary when you send, him, send okay. him that way. MCU hasn't really done it that way, except this is now not in that controlled space where they've designed it to potentially even let, you know, Rocket Raccoon uses it at one uh -huh. point. So it probably is like yeah. pretty safe. When Heimdall straight up says, All Father, uh, you know, send the dark magic through me one last time. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about the raw energy of this thing. Uh. In this version, it actually might be just like the comic version where he says that exact same phrase. There's not a lot of in entities that can withstand that, so Heimdall himself can, uh, though maybe it is killing him and he knows he's gonna die anyway, so it's uh -huh. fine. Hulk is one of the few creatures that can probably also oh, survive this straight up dark magic flowing right through him and sending Interesting. him down. So it's the difference of using a regulated microwave in your kitchen versus using plutonium to cook Which your you microwave dinner. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it works great, but uh, I do have this tail now and <laughs> it's pretty great. And you're riddled with tumors. <laughs> great, thank you so much for yep. sending your questions, folks, and uh, keep sending those questions at Big Question. And now comes the time to dig mm. in, to get real. <laughs> Guys, we take fan questions on this show. Yeah. These are questions that you guys send to our P.O. box, and then somebody sniffs them for uh, whatever powder you put on there, and, and then they, they get <laughs> real high, and then they pick which of them we should answer on this show. We got some fan questions from you guys. We haven't seen these, are you ready? Yes, okay. let's do it. <laughs> Happy Cactus 7 asked, 
Have you ever been the victim of a robbery or scam? I remember you having. Yeah, I have a couple that, times, yeah. right? Yeah, identity stolen. Uh, uh, I. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was, you apologize. It was funny though. Yeah. yeah. When we first moved to LA, like ten years ago, we both signed up for this Craigslist. You remember this? We signed up for a Craigslist no, audition. I, I didn't go. You told me about it, and you said yeah. you might go, and I'm like, I'm doing it. It's one of these things that you think is like a big deal, and apparently it's a rite of passage for a lot of actors when they when they First move to movie, LA. Yeah, yeah. You go to it, and it's this office in like you know downtown Hollywood, it's which not downtown. is not a it's good nothing. place. It's not a great it's, place. Has nothing to do with the movie industry. <laughs> yeah, and you go to this office, and you realize it's you're in this waiting room with a bunch of like odd suckers like yourself. You sit in there, and then you read from this weird. They call them sides, but it's just this like dumbass monologue that doesn't make any sense. And everyone gets like approved for it. And they tell you to call back at this certain time to find out about when your audition time is gonna be. Well, you find out it's like auditioning for background work. Because background work is just the easiest thing you can do. There's no qualification. You just show up at a certain place in Burbank and you line up and they'll be like, okay, you just call this time and you show up and you'll be in the background of NCIS. And you walk back and forth for an afternoon and you get paid like 60 bucks. It's nothing. But they make it seem like it's this big deal to get this. You get featured in these TV shows and movies and you don't know that it's for background work. But the way it's a scam is that you have to go through their guy to get your headshots, Mm -hmm. uh, to get your consultation. And all this stuff is the way they, they fish new actors to And they're LA. pretending essentially that they're your representation, that they're right. your manager. Yeah, and you do not need representation to get back home. To get back home. Yeah, right. absolutely not. Right. Anybody can do it. So um, six years you suffered this. Yes, right? I did. Yeah. Once I, I realized what was up, um, I, I blogged about it. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to blow the lid wide open <laughs> yeah. on this. Because the person who owns this company, you and I did some research, it's this weird sounding oh, yeah. dude named Emperor right. Frederick something von like Seidel or something like that. I blogged his name. Whoever this guy is commented on the blog defending his company. And I called you. I'm like, am I going to get sued for yeah. defamation? And, and I was I'm like, w- I'm not a lawyer, but no. Yeah. I got a ton of, on my blog at the time. It was like my most viewed thing because a ton of people, right. anytime you try to Google this guy, his name isn't doesn't show up anywhere except on my blog. But I think it's still around. We don't know what the name of the company is. It's probably run by the Scientologists because I think it was in a Scientology building. It was in a Scientology building. Yeah. yeah. And they have like emperors, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I got robbed once as a kid. I don't know that I need to share that. I think you do. I got robbed as a child, which is kind of funny. Um, just the fact that it's like such a terrible memory. Where were you? What happened? It was the middle of the night. My siblings were out um, because they used to go out. They would stay out all night. They were they were uh. bad kids. And our apartment was, we actually, all three of us, uh, me and my siblings shared the same bedroom, but, the, but they were out. My parents were like on kind of the far end of the apartment and our room was right up by the front of the house. I kind of had like insomnia as a kid, uh, really bad because I'd be waiting up for my, my siblings. Mm-hmm. And it was maybe like three or 4 a.m. and I had just turned off uh, Nick at night and watching like Dick Van Dyke or something. Mm-hmm. I was trying to go to sleep and then I heard the sound of what essentially was my, my siblings coming home or I thought it was, you know, opening the door and then opening the bedroom door and I figured well I'm sleeping in my brother's bed the the bigger bunk so I'm just gonna pretend I'm asleep here because otherwise it's gonna make me go go to my bunk then I realize neither of these voices are my brother or my (sighs) sister but they're whispering uh, and they're kind of like I can tell they're starting to go through stuff and they end up for for like 15 minutes ransacking the whole room (sighs) going through everything I'm not. I'm not looking at any of this because I've since realized, holy shit, these people are, are robbing us. Wait, and how old are you? I'm moment? maybe nine years old, maybe. Oh God. Maybe ten. Okay. And then I remember the last thing they area they do is they do the closet, which has like the loudest door, and it's mm. this big creak. It's like ah, like hugely loud. But I'm still here pretending I'm asleep in the same room. They go through the closet completely. They come back out, and then it seems like they're on their way out the room, out of the room. And then one of them, (laughs) this is so ridiculous, one of them leans down right over me as I'm pretending I'm asleep and I can tell I'm shaking like very violently and he (laughs) just laughs and he goes, this kid thinks that we think he's sleeping. (sighs) And and so of course I just like shit myself immediately. I know, he just like made it so much worse. And then they leave. And then I sit there for like maybe an hour and a half or two hours just frozen for like making sure that they're gone. And then, uh, and then I get up, I run to the kitchen and I get a knife 
just like a butter knife or something, <laughs> like whatever I can wield. And I like scour the house and or the apartment and there, there's no one there. And then I cried to my mom. And yeah, how she, brave yeah. of you to pick up a knife at that point. But you must have worked I, up. No, like, I was thinking about ending it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah, I probably yeah, exactly. would have thought. That, that knowing that this evil exists in the world for a man to say this to a young boy sleeping, but because not I, sleeping, right, knowing that he can hear you. I never opened my eyes. So maybe this is a coping mechanism. But for me, it's like, Marv and, uh, and Joe Pesci, <laughs> it's like just the Home Alone uh, robbers, <laughs> like the Sticky Bandits. Yeah, but it would be like Joe Pesci knowing that Macaulay Culkin can see his reflection in the ornament and just smiling. <laughs> like that's the evil and yeah. it's like l- terrifying. And, and have you gotten over this? Thank you for sharing this. Oh, I mean it like, I don't know, it probably scarred me in a bunch of ways, but I think made me slightly more interesting as a person by what, the end. What a story. Oh my um, god. That's a fun one. That yeah. Is evil. That was Next Donner. question. Denny Rowling. We visited your bedroom. Denny Rollins. Yeah. Well, now that I didn't think he was a murderer, but now I do. <laughs> <laughs> At t- <laughs> God, I got to go to therapy again. At Tekesti Mirren asks, how'd you guys get started? Like, who met who first, where, when? Okay, when Philip was a boy, I snuck into his <laughs> yeah, bedroom. Exactly. <laughs> I whispered uh, sweet nothings into his ear. What is our origin story? I feel like there's a couple different origin Us stories. Us getting started is different than like new rock stars. Yeah. yeah. We met in, in college doing improv at University of Florida and we were both part of the same like improv cult. It was a cult. Yeah. We're both survivors of a cult. Many of the people who work here at New Rock Stars, off screen producer and, and, and other folks. Oh, they're off screen producers. They're other all from producers. the same cult. They're all from the same cult. But Shout out to Theater Strike Force. Is there like <laughs> a specific Florida. story that uh, I think like I auditioned to be part of one of the house ensemble long form teams and then I went home and I blogged about it and I might have like mentioned you in the blog and right. I spelled your name wrong. And you made a joke that I was related to Alfred Molina. Right. People are getting an indication of how much you used to blog. <laughs> <laughs> I think I scoured them all from the internet. They aren't there. I scrubbed them. I do remember distinctly the first conversation we had. Hmm. I was in like uh, one of the food courts. I had just like applied to be the like a staff writer, an editorial blogger for the newspaper, <laughs> and they denied my application. But then there was another guy who did, who they accepted, and I was like talking shit about his like opinion piece. And then I was complaining about it to you because you knew me from and TSF. I, oh, I was, a, I was a complete stranger. So I thought yeah, I you walked court. up and you're like, yeah. hey, yeah, I, I saw your blog, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and you're like, I applied to be part of it too. And they're like, yeah, those alligator writers. Oh yeah, because I wrote an anti sports column. Yeah, and they did not run that. Yeah, yeah. so we commiserated over being rejected. <laughs> Look at us now. Yeah. <laughs> There's more to this story, I think, but we yeah. can eke it out. Yeah, over, you gotta keep asking yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Just keep prodding. There's that time that you punched me in the face. Yeah, but that was after that ha- years. Yeah, that yeah. happened years later. Yeah. And then at Holland, <laughs> Holland Totes. Totes. Uh, XO asked, have you ever had an awkward interaction with a celebrity? Oh. <laughs> uh, I so feel many. Like, yeah. I, yeah, when you're when you live in LA, this sounds like like a humble brag or something, but like you do run into them a lot yeah. at like Chipotle. Yeah, they live here. Uh, like, Oscar Nunez with that, with that Chipotle. Yeah, I saw Randall Park in front of me at a Starbucks, and yeah. he looked at me and smiled. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like I'll have a different story if I. But right now, the the only one that's coming to mind is uh, recently I got to interview um, Ralph Macchio. Oh yeah. And he br- brought his own uh, uh, hair and makeup guy that he's been working with forever, and this guy's name is for some reason is literally Bruce Wayne. <laughs> it's the guy's name, but then he also wouldn't let us see his ID. Uh, and, uh, okay, well, neither would Bruce Wayne. And, <laughs> that's true. And the guy, like, um, he like kind of looked at me, and I guess he kind of he's been working with Ralph for so long that he just decided that he needed to do the exact same hair and makeup to me <laughs> that he was doing to Ralph for our interview. Except like he, he kind of paints Ralph like in this kind of Sicilian way uh-huh. that is, you know, the the look that you're familiar with Ralph Macchio. But Ralph Macchio is, is actually a much paler than than he seems. Yeah. And so he then just turned to me and did the exact same thing to me, and the footage is unusable <laughs> because he tried to make me look like him, and we both like are sitting there, and it doesn't look great, but I look like I'm in blackface oh my God. next to Ralph Macchio. So we can't include an insert of this no, in the we video can't. version. You can imagine it. Yeah, I mean, I can literally never run for office. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a couple awkward encounters with celebrities. I used to work on a talk show where that kind of desensitized me to famous people because you see them come in and out the door every day. But we shared an office building with like people on other shows and right above us was Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is like my favorite show at the time. And I get, uh, the elevator opens right in front of my desk and I'm on my way out to lunch. And it opens and it, I see what I think is my friend Anna on my sketch team at the time. And I go, 
hey, because I wasn't expecting to see her, and I give her a big hug. Oh, no. And she goes, hey, and hugs me back, and as soon as I'm hugging her, I realize this is not Anna. This Terry is Cruz. <laughs> Terry Cruz, who I did see in the elevator, not Terry Cruz, it is Michelle Romero, who plays Santiago right. on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, <laughs> and we release, and I'm like, hmm, and she just hugs me because she assumes that she's supposed to know who I am, and oh, I realize, God. and I just go, so how's it going today? <laughs> and she goes, going great. How have you been? And I'm like, how have you been? It's been, it's been good. Oh, busy, God. busy. And we just make small talk. I think she just assumed that she was supposed to remember who I was. She probably some, assumed someone, you were like some writer or some something. Some writer or someone who worked on a previous show of hers or just some old friend. And like we wait for that elevator. It was the longest elevator ride in my life. As I realized I was not best friends with Michelle Romero. But for that moment, wow. for a brief second as we hugged, we were Did best you friends. ever see her again or they told you you can't? I, I <laughs> saw her around, but I would avoid, you know, that same elevator would take the stairs. <laughs> this has been fun. <laughs> we got some questions answered and some memories re-triggered. Um, yeah, you know why I am the way I am now. You can always mail us our fan mail at uh, the thing that is in our lower the third. PO box. The PO box. And thank you to everyone who sent in the questions. Keep those questions coming at New Rockstars hashtag big, big question. We are getting progressively more drunk as the show goes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is why you can't blame him. That's right. <laughs> um, and you can follow us on social media at EA Voss, at Philip Molina, and you can follow New Rockstars at New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars here on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week. Bye-bye.